In this video, I will show you some implications of the way an event loop works in JavaScript, as well as three techniques that you can use in your code to leverage the way the event loop works. These are ideas you can use in your JavaScript code today and make the most of the event loop and also write code that is responsive and efficient. Let's check it out. Before we get started, this tutorial requires an understanding of how the JavaScript event loop works, right? So if you need a refresher, here's a quick tutorial explaining what the JavaScript event loop is with a basic real world example. So go watch that and then continue watching this. So first of all, let's start with the fact that JavaScript does not have a sleep method, okay? So for example, let's say you want some line of code to execute and then it has to pause for two seconds, and after two seconds, your second line of code needs to execute, all right? So let's say this is your requirement. You really cannot do something like this, okay? You really cannot say sleep for like 2,000 milliseconds. This doesn't work, all right? Can you guess why? Well, the reason is, if JavaScript had something like this, that would basically block what's essentially the only thread that runs the application, all right? So it really wouldn't work well. That's the reason why you don't have like a sleep or a wait method in JavaScript. So that begs the question, like we have to do something like this. You wanna execute something, then wait for some time and then execute something else. Well, how do you do it in JavaScript? Well, you can do this using a method called set timeout. Okay, set timeout is a way in which you can have something execute after some time, but there is a catch here, and that catch is thanks to the JavaScript event loop model, right? So first of all, the basic usage of set timeout is something like this, right? You call set timeout and you pass in two arguments. First is a function that you want executed, and second is the time after which you, this function needs to be executed. Okay, so you can pass in a function and here you say number of time, you know, amount of time in milliseconds after which this function needs to be run, right? So you pass that to set timeout. Set timeout doesn't immediately execute this guy. It waits for these many milliseconds and only after that will this function get executed, all right? So here's an example usage of set timeout. I have a function here called print hello, which just prints the message hello to the console. Now I can pass this to set timeout and give a time of 5,000 milliseconds, which is basically five seconds, right? So now you know that it is going to execute print hello exactly after five seconds. Or will it? You remember how JavaScript is single-threaded. Now, when that time is passed, that time in milliseconds that you pass to set timeout, when that time is passed, when that single JavaScript thread really isn't doing anything, well, great, that function that you passed will be executed. But what if at this time, this thread is actually in the middle of executing something else? Now that you know the event loop, you know that these things may not happen immediately. When the time is up, the function doesn't immediately execute. Instead, that callback function that you passed to set timeout gets put to the back of the event queue so that whatever is currently being executed is not interrupted in any way. So when you pass that value for time in milliseconds to set timeout, what you're providing is not the time at which exactly it gets executed, it's a time after which that function gets added to the event queue. When it actually runs, you really cannot say ahead of time, and there's really no guarantee about when. It's only gonna get executed after that time, whenever the event loop is done doing whatever it's executing at that time. So this brings up an interesting use case and application of set timeout that you will actually see out there in the wild. You might see something like this, a set timeout call to execute some function, but with the time duration of zero milliseconds. This looks weird, doesn't it? Like why would somebody use set timeout when the wait is really, literally zero milliseconds? Well, here's the use case. Let's say you're writing some uh, JavaScript code to call some important function that has to be executed. And then somewhere in between these important functions, you also need to make sure you call some other function which is slightly less important, right? It doesn't have to be run right away, but it still needs to be run and then you have other important functions that need to be executed. Now the problem is that you cannot really kick off both the important functions 
and the less important functions at the same time. Because if you proceed in this execution order, this function is going to wait for this function to complete execution. I'm assuming all, they're all synchronous functions here, right? So this thing has, has to execute only after this is completed executing, right? So you don't want that. You want the important functions to execute together and you want the less important function to execute only after all the important stuff is done, all right? So what do you do? Well, you can basically stick a set time out here and pass the less important function and say, okay, I want this executed after some time. Now the question is, what is the time you pass to this? You don't know when this is gonna get executed. If you know that this is gonna get executed and be done in like two seconds, you can say, I want this to be two seconds, but you don't know that. Well, your goal is really to execute this function only after this function is done. Everything else that's important is done. Well, that's done by passing zero to set timeout because guess what happens? It goes to the back of the event queue, right? This unimportant function or the less important function gets executed only after this is done because by the very fact that you're calling set timeout with a zero timeout, you're putting this to the back of the event queue and basically saying, don't disturb anything else that's executing right now, just put it to the back of the queue and when you're done with everything else, only then you pick that up. Right, so this is a good use case for set timeout by passing in zero as the timeout. All right, so let's move on to the second strategy. Another usage of set timeout that leverages this event loop is this pattern to chunk the execution of processor heavy work. Okay, anytime you need to execute anything that is processor heavy in JavaScript, you need to be careful again because of that single application thread. For example, imagine a situation where you need to run data processing on this long array of objects, okay? And a uh, lot of data crunching, a lot of processing work. Some people will say outright that you don't wanna do this in JavaScript. Well, in a way they're right, because if you just write a function that processes all the data at once, you will get into trouble because you are gonna be using and taking over that single application thread. When your function starts running, well, nothing else can run. So for example, if you have a button click handler or another timed function, well, everything else is waiting. But there is another way to run computations like this without affecting other things and still staying responsive to event handlers like button clicks and renders and so on. The way you do this is by doing this work in parts, using a combination of chunking the data and using set timeout strategically. So let's say this is a function, right? So I have a process array function, which takes in a big array, a lot of data to process. And this function just looks at those data one by one, and then it processes it. Now the way to chunk this, the way to break this down is by slightly changing the way this function works. So for example, let's say I do this. I change this process array function to not process the whole array at once, but to instead look at the starting point, right? It needs to process this array at a certain starting point onwards. And then I also set a batch size. I set a certain amount of elements that I'm gonna process in every execution. Okay, so let's say I define this batch size. It can be like, okay, every 10 elements or every 50 elements, every time I call this process array, it is going to ex execute and process only this many elements, okay? So I have a loop here, which starts from the starting point that's passed in as an argument, and then it processes up to start plus this batch size, okay? And I'm gonna process each individual element one by one, okay? Now this is going to basically chunk what was formerly just one function executing this thing over this whole big array to a small window into this big array, which is basically start up to start plus batch size. Okay, that's great, but now what's gonna happen to the rest of the elements? Who's gonna call the rest of the elements? Well, this is again where set timeout helps. The end of this batch, I'm going to call set timeout with this process array again, the big array again passed in, but I'm going to start with start plus batch size. And I'm again calling this, I'm passing this to set timeout with a zero millisecond delay. So it is going to get put on the back of the queue and then it gets picked up if nothing else is happening. Now notice here that since I'm breaking this up, let's say this whole execution for this first batch took, let's say X milliseconds, all right, or X seconds. Now, if there were other events that happened during this time, let's say the user clicked on a button or some render needs to happen or some other function needs to be called, those 
will be there in the queue, will be there in the event queue. Now, the very fact that I have ended this execution and put set timeout means that those will get executed next. And only after that, this next batch is gonna get executed. So any events that happen during this one iteration of the batch will get processed before the next iteration of this batch is going to be picked up. Okay, so that makes it more responsive. So you're essentially computing large amount of data while at the same time staying responsive to other events. I notice as I say this that there is a bug here, which is that I'm not considering the end of the array, but you get the idea. Next, let's look at strategy number three. The final strategy that you should have in your arsenal when working with event loops and the single JavaScript thread is a strategy to not use the event loop and that single application thread sometimes. Yes, for certain types of long running operations, you can completely bypass and not use that single application thread at all. If you need to execute such long operations in JavaScript, like the example that I showed you, processing a large amount of data, and you don't wanna block the single application thread, you can definitely do so using a feature called web workers. Yes, you can create a new web worker thread in your JavaScript and then give it a JavaScript file to execute. Okay, so this is the signature, this is how it works. I have a new worker created over here and I'm passing it a JavaScript file. So script file.js contains some code that needs to be executed, some long processing and you know intensive process calculation or whatever it is, right? I am creating this worker which is going to execute the script file in a separate thread, right? I have the handle to that worker in a variable called worker, but basically this is off in its own thread doing this processing and your main application thread is unaffected. It's free to handle any other needs uh, that your application has. Here is a rough diagram of how web workers work. So your main application thread creates a web worker like I just showed you there by creating a new worker and it basically creates a new thread and it goes off, does its own thing. I create another new worker, it creates another thread and it goes off and does its own thing while the main thread is not blocked, okay? So typically web workers are used for running these kind of tasks without interfering with the user interface. Now there are a bunch of caveats to web workers. They are, again, like I said, used for offloading processing, but it does not run in the window context, okay? You don't have a global window variable. You don't have access to the DOM because imagine if you have all those multiple threads accessing the DOM at the same time, you run into a whole lot of race conditions, right? They're not a good idea. And that's probably the reason why they have blocked it. You typically use web workers as functions where you give it everything it needs, right? It's kind of stateless in that sense. You give it all the arguments you, it needs to process it, and then it does its work. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do they communicate? You send the web worker to go do something, but you might wanna have some kind of access to what it's doing, you know, exchange data and all that stuff. Well, you can do that. You can have communication using this mechanism called post message, right? You can have your main application post messages to your worker threads, and you can have your worker threads post message back to your main application thread, right? So the way it works is by using this API called post message. You remember we hold, held on to this worker variable, uh, my worker variable. I can say my worker variable dot post message, and I can pass in any data that I need to send to the worker, okay? Now in the worker uh, in a code, I can access the data by basically having an event handler. I can say on message, like when somebody sends me a message, execute this function, right? And this function is gonna contain this data in this function argument. And then now this worker can also post message back to the main thread by calling post message. In the main application thread, I had to do worker dot post message, but in the worker thread itself, in the worker code base, I just say post message because the implicit context there is the main application thread and it is going to post message to that main application thread with this with this result. And now again, I can have an on message in the main application thread to, pro to receive this data and do something with it, all right? So in summary, we've looked at these three strategies to deal with the event loop and the single application thread. First was the set timeout, effective usage of set timeout, sometimes with the zero timeout, which makes perfect sense. Second, batching your work so that you're not 
continuously taking on the application thread. Instead, you still take breaks to allow other things to happen. And then the third strategy is to not use the main application thread at all, and instead use web workers. Now, if web workers has piqued your interest and you wanna learn more, check out this video about what web workers are really all about. I explain what you can do with web workers and also how it's different from another related concept called service workers. Check that out and I'll see you there.